put in the pocket. Okay. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, with the, yeah, this being the last talk of the afternoon, I'm happy to say that it will be light, so that's good. Uh, in the uh, OULET lab, where I work together with uh, Michael Sinhuber, we study the collective behavior of uh, insect swarms. And to be more precise, uh, midge swarms. Uh, be but because not a lot of people know what midges are, I usually say insect swarms. Midges are uh, a group of insects that include many small species of flies. And in our lab, we have a big tank where we have a colony of uh, midges. And midges are interesting because uh, unlike other collectively behaving uh, animal groups, uh, they do not show any alignment. They're just randomly uh, moving uh, about, as you can see on the right there, where I'm showing you the uh, long-term trajectories and uh, instantaneous positions. Uh, so that's precisely the reason why we're interested in them. Uh, we try to measure uh, microscopic properties of these swarms and then relate that to their uh, individual movement. So the, the black square that you see below the swarm is called a swarm marker and it serves the function of uh, a nucleation point. So a single midge was, will start to fly above such an object and then other midges uh, will join it. And in nature, it can be any contrasting uh, object in the environment. Uh, in our experiments, we have this black square marker. The biological purpose of the swarming is uh, to mate. So the, the swarm is mostly composed of uh, males, and then females fly in, and then they uh, get chased, and they mate. In a previous study, uh, Nick and his postdoc, Ray Nee, found out that they could manipulate the swarm uh, by moving the marker. They split a marker in two and found that they could create two subswarms that uh, were attracted to each other. And um, they found that the swarms were attracted because the uh, centers of the subswarms were not aligned with the centers of the marker. So they were slightly closer to each other, which led them to believe that there was an attraction between the subswarms. So as if there is some elasticity. Now, they could not measure the elasticity because we don't know what the force is that the marker applies to the swarm. It's not in contact. It has some effect on the swarm, but we don't know exactly what force that is. Now, in this study, um, we are moving the marker back and forth like a rheological experiment. And what this allows us to do is we can circumvent the problem. We don't know what force we're applying or what strain. Uh, what we see is that a wave propagates upward to the swarm, and by uh, studying this wave, we can determine the viscoelastic properties of uh, a midge swarm. Now, this is the experimental setup. As I said, we have a large uh, tank uh, in which we have this colony of midges. The, uh, the blue uh, bar is uh, a linear stage, which we uh, use to move the uh, black marker uh, in an os oscillatory fashion. We have the midges on, um, or I should mention that uh, the species is Caronomus riparius. We have them on an artificial day-night cycle, and they swarm on, well, on the dusk and dawn of this cycle. Well, the amplitude is uh, 84 millimeters. We vary the frequency. We have not yet done an amplitude uh, variation. That's what we're going to do next. And we use three cameras, and then we obtain stereo match positions at a frame rate of 100 frames per second. And because the uh, midges are uh, well, uh, sensitive to light, we use infrared light to uh, light them up. So this is the a typical response. So you see the marker in red moving back and forth. And those are the midges. And you can sort of see them moving left and right. If we face average uh, the center of mass of the midges, we obtain the uh, data on the right. So the red is the uh, center of the marker and black the face averaged uh, center of mass of the swarm. And we see indeed that it's oscillating back and forth uh, with a slight uh, phase shift and smaller amplitude. So here again is the uh, 
face average center of mass, but in the bottom of the swarm. And then we, when we go up to higher layers, we see actually that the amplitude uh, decays, and there's also a small shift in the phase, very small, but it's there. So we can fit these curves to obtain the uh, phase uh, difference and the amplitude. And then here I'm showing you this fitted uh, uh, phase and amplitude uh, on top of the video. So the blue dots are for the different layers, uh, the phase average signal, so that's uh, over the full experiment, 60 periods, and then you still see the images behind. And so the, the signal that you see, the blue dots, is like a very long time average. So on average, they show this behavior. Uh, and what you already can see here is actually that it looks like there's a wave traveling up through the swarm. Now, such a propagating shear wave with the, uh, the amplitude of the oscillation of the uh, wave uh, perpendicular to the direction of movement uh, can be written uh, like that with uh, uh, the amplitude S and then the, the movement direction is Z. And we see that the, um, the amplitude decay it comes from the exponential with uh, minus Kiz and the phase change comes from the minus KR, uh, KRZ. Uh, the uh, complex uh, wave number K star uh, uh, well, is composed of KR and KI, and is also related to uh, G star, which is the complex shear modulus. And the complex shear modulus uh, is composed of G prime and G double prime, the storage modulus and the loss modulus. The storage modulus is a measure for the elastic uh, part of the material or the swarm uh, and uh, the stored energy, while the, uh, the loss modulus uh, is a measure for the dissipated energy or the viscous part. And we can uh, rewrite uh, G prime and G double prime in terms of KR and KI, and then you can already see that if we uh, get the, the decay of the amplitude as a function of height and the phase change as a function of height, uh, and we fit those, we can obtain Ki and Kr. And that's exactly what I've done here. So on the left here, we see the amplitude as a function of height, and on the right, the phase change as a function of height. So that's the, the phase difference with respect to the marker. So the marker is phase zero, and um, that's the, the swarm. And you see there is a small uh, plateau there. So the bottom of the swarm seems to react more uniformly to the marker, but then a little bit higher up, we see a decay of the amplitude and a change of the phase. So when we fit these, uh, we obtain Ki and Kr, and we calculate uh, G prime and G double prime. Here I'm showing you uh, for different frequencies, uh, the loss modulus and the storage modulus. And uh, interestingly, the uh, storage modulus is uh, negative, which is not unphysical, but uncommon. The uh, loss modulus is linear increasing, and also the wave speed, which is simply the frequency over Kr, which is linearly increasing. So what this suggests, the, the wave speed, is that the information, the speed of information uh, transferred to the swarm is of the order of one meter per second, and that's also roughly the average velocity of a midge in, in the swarm. So that, that sort of makes sense. I have fitted the uh, loss modulus and storage modulus with these two functions, uh, the blue and the red one, and that's from a model that is based, a viscoelastic model that's based on uh, a spring uh, with elasticity E, a viscous dash, dash pot with uh, viscosity eta, and a mass. So this is um, the typical uh, Voigt model, but then with a mass added. And what this mass does, it, it adds some inertia to the system. And you can see that through the parameter i rho, it allows the g prime to be negative. And the, the fit actually shows very nicely that uh, then we have a constant elasticity, a constant viscosity uh, for, the, for the swarm as a function of frequency. The fact that there is some inertia uh, is, is probably linked to uh, the swarm is, is active. So midges have a certain 
uh, time before they react. So they're moving in a certain direction, the marker is moving back, and they're like, oh, wait, oh, it's moving, and then they come. So that's where sort of an effective inertia uh, comes from. And then to uh, conclude, the uh, Mitchwarm's viscoelasticity is an emergent property. It's, it demonstrates that the Mitchwarm is not simply uh, a group of insects flying above the mark, which might as well have been a possibility, that they're all individually looking at the mark and saying, well, we're here because of this marker. But it actually shows that layers higher up in the swarm, they're not looking at the marker, they're looking at midges below them. Uh, it can be seen as a bulk measure for the uh, collectivity of the system. Possibly if, if the system was not behaving collectively, there would not be this, uh, this measure. And then it tells us about information uh, propagation. So we have the speed of the information, and we have a uh, measure for how much information is lost. That's the, the, the loss modulus. And then we have some uh, uh, well, non-lossy uh, information, the storage modulus. And what we will do next is uh, vary the amplitude to see if there is a linear regime, non-linear regime. And we're intending to have two markers and then oscillate those to see if we can get maybe a similar elasticity from the attraction between two swarms. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you.